by the power of Ray Scott. That's a big twinkie. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another segment of the Serial Box Prize podcast. The podcast is I'm your host, Steve Garcia, and I'm here with my co host, Aaron Smelter. What's happening? How are we doing tonight? Man, doing good, doing good, doing good, man. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. And today it's going to be a, a great show because we have a lot of great topics. When we're just not dwelling on just one topic. But uh, I just want to get started. And you know how we always get started the show. And that's like, how was your week, Aaron? It was good. It was good. Um, so I think the last time we talked was Sunday. Um, I finally found that stupid Baroness figure, which is not stupid. It's awesome. But hunting that thing down took quite a, quite a few, uh, trips to target. So, <laughs> um, so I finally got the GI Joe classified Baroness. That was kind of the, the highlight of the week. Um, I also found the beachhead the same day, which was another target exclusive, um, and so, uh, yeah, and that, that was, that was, that was, uh, uh, like almost like an adrenaline rush. I think we talked about that in one of the previous podcasts of just like when you find something kind of in the wild, that's like, Oh my God, I finally found it. So, uh, yeah, th those are checked off the list and, um, went to the flea market on Sunday and, uh, found a few things, added another couple Joe's, uh, vintage Joe's to the collection. Nothing too crazy. Um, but man, it's been scarce out there. I mean, hitting up the flea markets, hitting up the um, hitting up the thrift stores, the Facebook marketplace. I have not found a good kind of vintage score in quite some time. Yeah, it's crazy that you say that because, like, for the audience listening, me and Aaron, we frequent the same flea market every Sunday, and it's like, honestly. I found that Technodrome, and I remember that day like it was yesterday because you and Dave, and for those listening, Dave is our, our right-hand toy man. We get a lot of toys from him. He has a, a toy store in uh, Goffstown, New Hampshire. But, yeah, like, it's true what you're saying. I haven't really found anything at the flea market, which is like a holy grail. Like I said, like, the Technodrome was a good find. Uh, the Talk Boy was a good find and i think the last thing that i found was that dino turtle um yeah. and i uh i gave it a dave you know because you know like i guess the turtle went online i checked ebay prices it was like a 70 dollar, 65 dollar toy you know i gave yeah. it a dave because he's he's always hooking us up with stuff and i'm like here man you can sell this at the store so i i gave it to him but yeah i haven't really like every sunday i wake up in the morning Brush my teeth and I'm like, all right, it's Sunday. Gonna hit up the flea market. Dave and Eric are gonna be there. We're gonna find some holiness. And then lately, it's just been scraps. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been disheartening. But I mean, like you know, like I talked in the previous podcast, you just gotta kind of keep your nose to the grindstone and just keep going. But it's 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 always that one week like that you don't go that you, you, you don't know what you miss out on. So it, it's almost like you have to suffer through the, the bullshit <laughs> and like, I'm like, I, okay, I got to go every week, whether, whether I find something, whether or not I don't find something just, just so that like, you can say, okay, there was nothing there, you know, <laughs> because yeah. if you don't, if you don't go, then it's almost like that, like, Oh, what did I miss? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Like, honestly, I feel like all my great finds have been from you and Dave. Like this past Sunday, uh, for the audience listening, uh, I've been collecting uh, street sharks and I'm trying to collect all these weird, obscure T TMNT knockoff lines like street sharks and biker mice from Mars and, you know, just trying to have that TNMT knockoff shelf. 
And yeah, you you blessed me with a street shark over the weekend that I did not have. So I just want to say thank you, man. And that was like a good five dollars there, Aaron. So thanks for that, bro. Yeah, man. No, I mean, and and that's, you know, that's the one thing about this community is that like once you find, you know, like we have we have our little group, you know, and once you find that those those people in kind of your inner circle, um, you know, that, you know, you help each other out. And and that's kind of the cool thing. You know, Dave knows that I look for Thundercats and, you know, I mean, you you and Dave know that I look for Thundercats um and a couple other lines like battle beasts and stuff like that and i know that you look for street sharks and kind of the obscure turtles and dave kind of looks for like the more obscure stuff like i found that really creepy like roger rabbit that i gave him you know uh, <laughs> yeah you know like i mean and it, and it, and we all kind of just mesh you know and it, and it works out and but it's all about just kind of helping each other out you know with with your collections but it's also about being just good friends. And, you know, if we find something, you know, here, you know, here you go. So, no, I'm more than happy. If I find any street sharks, they're coming your way because I can't, like I told you a couple of weeks ago, I can't start collecting anything. <laughs> I, got, <laughs> I, got, I got too much stuff. That's the thing about being a toy collector. It's like once you start collecting and collecting and then you look at all the stuff you collected, you're like, I need to get rid of some of this stuff. And <laughs> that's what ended up happening with me. And, you know, like me and you, we give a lot of stuff to, uh, you know, Dave and stuff. And I ended up giving Dave just a bunch of extra stuff that I had because it's like now I'm just focusing on vintage 80s, 90s toys and not just toys in general. Because I was just collecting Funko Pops. And I know there's people out there that don't like Funkos. I don't even know why I have Funko Pops. I had like all these Simpson characters and I love the Simpsons. Don't get me wrong, but I had like two shelves just filled with Simpson. I'm like. I don't need all this. Like, have you ever looked at your toy shelf, Aaron? And like, as you're looking at it, there's that one particular shelf of just obscure lines. And you're like, why do I have that there? Like, yeah, yeah. I think, I think we all, either it's a shelf or a bin or something, you know? And I mean, I, I, I definitely have, I definitely have stuff that I just like, I bought just to buy just at the time. I was like, Oh, that's cool. That looks cool. Or, or maybe it was a line that I, I thought that I would start collecting and it just, you know, I, I maybe bought one or two figures from it and then it just kind of died out. And yeah, I mean, I think, I think as toy collectors at some point you have to sit back and go, okay, like, what am I really focusing on? What's my goal? And it's almost like a business decision, right? You have to sit there and like sit down and go, okay, like, I'm I'm really this is this is my like five year plan. <laughs> I'm gonna write this down and and this is gonna be this is gonna be my goal going forward. But it's just funny how all of a sudden like a new toy line will come out or you know like for me I was never intending on collecting those classified series. I thought they looked cool. I thought they were neat. The one that I did want was the Baroness, um, but I never intended on collecting them. And now. You know, I'm going to freaking targets, you know, like crazy, you know, eight in the morning, you know, as soon as they open. And what's crazy is, though, and I think I told you this, is that like every time I go, you're you're seeing and you're meeting all of these other people, you know, that are collecting these G.I. Joe classified series. And it's been kind of a cool scenario, you know, but I had never intended on collecting those, you know. You know, what's funny it's I've ran into also other toy collectors, but you can literally see who's a toy collector like when they're in that aisle. Like I was in the aisle looking for turtles for Nick of Turtles one time and I see this guy down down my aisle. I'm like, hmm, khaki cargo shorts, uh, little dirty Nike sneakers with mud on them, a Star Wars T-shirt, long ponytail facial hair. I'm like, this guy's a toy collector. So like, <laughs> so and the funny thing is that I, I'm looking at him, but I can also see from the corner of the eye he's looking at me because I'm wearing shorts and I'm wearing a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles T-shirt, right? Yeah. So so we're both just staring at each other like from far away, and like then all of a sudden I'm like, you know what? Let me go talk to this guy. So I go down the aisle and I'm like, hey man, you a toy collector? He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, what are you here looking for, G.I. Joe? I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, what about you? I'm like, oh, I'm just looking for the NECA Turtles. He's like, yeah, man, I haven't really ran into those. And he was just like 
cool to see like, hey, man, there are other people out there crazy enough just like me trying oh, yeah. to get this stuff, you know? And then we started yeah. talking about like, you know, how like you can't find things and, you know, he's having a hard time. I was I was explaining about you trying to get the Baroness and it was just like cool to bump in other collectors. So that's awesome, man. Yeah. So so funny that, that kind of leads right into the next thing is that like I so I met this one guy. His name's Tyler. Um, he's on Instagram um, under the, the screen name 3D Printing Forge. Um, and so what he, he so we we get to talking we're in the toy aisle right we're there we're there at you know eight in the morning at target and you know and so we're talking and and, and we're talking about the classified series so and the one target you know we we run into each other and we're like oh okay you know yeah this is what we're looking for don't really talk much well, unbeknownst to me, we're both driving to the next target <laughs> because that's because that's how freaking, you know, competitive this crap is. And so we go to the next target. I don't know he's going. He doesn't know I'm going. And we run into each other again at the at the damn toy aisle. Right. And so so super nice guy. We get to talk in and he is making customs 3d printed customs for um the gi joe classified series nice and his stuff is phenomenal so he's creating um 3d printed weapons um he created a 3d printed um cobra commander like golden cobra throne um he did a um a custom um stinger which is the destro's jeep uh, and, and I mean, this stuff is 3d printed, but it's on a, on a one six scale. So it's a pretty big vehicle and, and I, it looks great. He's coming out with more concepts, more ideas. Um, I've been talking to him back and forth. He's a fellow toy collector, toy aficionado and, um, really cool. So if you guys have a second, um, check out, check him out on Instagram, 3d printing forge. And um, check out some of his custom works. I mean, I, I think that it is phenomenal to see some of these customs um, to make these kind of dioramas and make these one six scale vehicles that, you know, you know, aren't going to be made because they're going to be so expensive. Um, I think I can't remember that how many hours it says that he takes to print it. I want to say it was something like 80 hours. To wow. print one of the the vehicles, um, the the Stinger Jeep that he's that he makes, it takes eighty hours to print. So, I think the if I'm remembering this correctly, if not, don't shoot me. I think I think he was charging one hundred and fifty dollars to three D print that vehicle. But I'm telling you what, that thing is worth every penny when you put Destro next to that thing or inside of it. The doors open and close. Um, it's got movable, like the, it rolls, it's gotten like the snap on wheels, like the old GI Joe's had. It, it is really, really freaking cool. So I am really tempted. Um, once, uh, I can have some extra expenditure money or maybe he can hook me up if he listens to this <laughs> um, and, um, you know, to, to, to get one of those, but I'd have to get another Destro and another, um, Cobra commander to take out of the package. Cause I'm not opening those damn things. <laughs> okay. Aaron, as you were explaining that, like, you know, how the doors were opening and fitting Destro, like I was over here saliving like Homer Simpson. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, <laughs> Like there was just all this saliva just coming off of me, man. Yeah, it's it's funny. I remember when you told me how you met that guy, and then like, um, you told me to check out the Instagram. And man, you are not kidding, Aaron, when you say this guy is amazing. Because like, I saw the uh, the Cobra Commander chair that he did. Yeah, the throne. Yeah. Oh my! I was like, that is amazing. And it's funny how you mentioned how you weren't expecting to collect the classified series, but like. After I saw those pictures, I'm like, I need a Destro and I need a Cobra Commander now. <laughs> so, yeah. So I am yeah. definitely getting at least a Destro and Cobra Commander. Yeah, I mean, and and the, the the detail that goes into them. I mean, I think being, I think everybody was kind of like, you know, the one six scale uh, GI Joes. They're like, ugh, you know, like because everybody's so used to the three and three quarters inch, you know, and 
I think that, you know, as collectors, you know, I think that one six scale, it's good for making customs. It's good for making dioramas. It's good for posing. They're more articulated. And I, I think that, you know, overall, you know, that's going to kind of be that three and three quarters inch scale for collectors, you know, if, if that makes sense, like that's going to be kind of the baseline, you know, NECA is doing <clears throat> one six scale, um, you know, and, or the, I, I keep on saying one six, six, the six inch scale. Um, and I, I think that six inch scale is kind of that sweet spot. You know, um, I've seen a lot of pic uh, p people like taking pictures and putting them kind of in like jungle scenes and stuff like that. And I mean, they, they photograph really well. And it's funny because like, you know, little kids ain't playing with this shit. This is, this is adults, you know, you, you're <laughs> yeah. your age and my age, you know, every, every toy toy guy that I've seen at targets, you know, to hunt these things down, they're all thirties, forties, you know, I mean, yep. there's no, there's no 10 year olds hunting these things down, you know? <laughs> and, yep. and it's, it's fantastic because we're reliving our childhood through these, through these figures. And I, like I told you last time during this pandemic, I think we're just grabbing on to whatever we can to just kind of, take us to that happy place yeah and, and you know what Aaron like you brought up a good topic where you were like because I remember when these G.I. Joe classified series came out and a lot of people were like oh we don't know about this one six scale like we want like the three and three quarter like original G.I. Joe you know right. size figures and then all of a sudden after all the hate you know all these G.I. Joe fans were like whoa well these are amazing and like you know, like all oh, the 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 articulation, and like you said, like you can use these for toy for toy photography. Uh, yeah. You know, you can pose them. I mean, there's a lot, and there's always that like uh, that like divide where are you just a vintage toy collector or do you collect also modern? And like I've had that question asked to me, like, okay, do you just collect vintage toys or do you also do modern? Because I've met guys who just do vintage. They don't collect anything that's modern. But for me, if it looks aesthetically, it looks well, it's amazing, it's articulated, and it's modern, then why not? You know, like, I, I, I love vintage toys, but, you know, I'm not going to say no to a G.I. Joe classified figure that looks aesthetically amazing and there's, like, 36 points of articulation, so. Right. And, and I think, I think it like, you know, going back to that five-year plan, <laughs> you know, I, I think you got to sit there and think like, because you and I both know, and, and this will kind of lead into the next topic. You and I both know that this, this hobby is not cheap. And, yeah. and so I think for somebody looking to be like, okay, I can go on eBay right now and buy a bulk lot of vintage Ninja Turtles for, $250 and get, you know, 20 different characters. Okay, sure. Or, you know, you're going to spend, because G.I. Joe is stupid hot right now, you're going to spend $500 on a bulk lot of G.I. Joe and kind of have a miniature instant collection, you know, with a couple key characters and a couple vehicles. Okay, but going to freaking Target and dropping 20 to 40 to $60 a week on, on figures or, you know, whatever... That, that's it's going to add up quick. So I think I think it's all about kind of like, you know, how a does it bring you happiness? If it brings you happiness, obviously, you know, if, if you can afford it, by all means, do what you can. Don't put yourself in debt by collecting toys, you know, but I think if it brings you happiness, go for it. But I think the second part of that is you really kind of have to go. All right you know, man, those, those, uh, star Wars black series look really cool, but can I afford to start putting those on a shelf too? You know, you really kind of yeah. have to, narrow, you narrow down that, you know, um, get collection. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what, you hit another great topic where it's like, like you said, like collecting toys can get expensive. Like, and, you know, thank God, like we were talking about earlier that me, you and Dave, you know, we're always watching out for each other. We're friends and stuff. And because yeah. you sold me um, for my vintage Casey Jones, his accessory for the weapons. And, you know, and you sold them for me for cheap for like 15 yeah. bucks. But one baseball bat goes for like nine to ten dollars. Just yeah. one bat. 
you know, and for you to sell it for me for like $15, you know, that was amazing. So, you know, this hobby, it, it is an expensive hobby. And that's why lately, when it comes to accessories, I've just been like, you know what? If I find this guy like this, it is what it is. Because like, as I'm looking at my shelf now talking to you, I have tons and tons of vintage toys that are missing so many accessories. But for me to get all these accessories, I'm going to drop like two or three grand. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, okay, do I really need, um, uh, what's his name from Thundercat? Uh, Lionel's uh glove and his sword like do i really need it like yes. like is- yes 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 steve as a thundercats collector yes you do <laughs> <laughs> so i know i do want the thundercat and the thunder lair like you the thunder lair like i know you're looking for that so yeah yeah we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit <laughs> yeah 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 but yeah Aaron, like you said like like you said brother man like it's true it's it's it's, it's you know you got to pick and choose and like people come into my room and they're like whoa Dude, you must have spent like so much money. How can you afford all these toys? And I'm just like, well, it's it's not about just affording it. It's like I'm not going to drop sixty five dollars on a toy if I have to buy groceries. You right. know what I'm saying? You have to put priorities too, my. Uh, yes, we want all these toys, but you also got to be responsible. And, you know, thank God for you and Dave, because 90 percent of my collection has come from Dave. Yeah, and I've saved a lot of money because we get great deals from him. But yeah, man, it's crazy. I can't see myself every week dropping sixty, sixty, sixty every week, man. Yeah, and, and I and I think you know that's what it boils down to. But then there's kind of like these must haves, you know. Um, I know, I know with you, you know, in, in your recent, you know, acquiring of like the NECA stuff, you know, like the NECA stuff is really expensive. But that is, I mean, like talk about the points of articulation and the detail and the, you know, those NECA turtles are phenomenal. But, you know, and I wanted to kind of pick your brain on this. What do you think of the new uh, diorama that just came out? So the diorama is amazing. I think it looks awesome. I did see that diorama at the New York Toy Fair when Pixel Dan was interviewing Randy uh, yeah. and I and I saw it. So my thing with NECA toys, um, NECA is my favorite toy company, hands down. Uh, they just do amazing work, uh, amazing details when it comes to the actor, the likeness and everything. Um, so I just collect the movie line um, and that's it. Like I haven't collected Metalhead. I haven't done any of the Toon Turtles because for me, for the Toon Turtles, I already have the vintage stuff. Um, the movie in 1990, when I came out, I remember going to theaters and watching that as a kid. So there's a special place in my heart for that film. And this is the first time that we get uh, movie turtles that look exactly like the film. I mean, we did have the uh, Secret of the Ooze uh, Playmate turtles. And those were pretty cool, you know, and, and they've gone up in price. But, you know, NECA doing like the 1990 film. And, you know, I just acquired Super Shredder. And they're starting to do different head sculpts for the figures like... Like, it's amazing. Now, going back to the diorama, like, I think it looks amazing. Am I going to get it? I don't think I'm going to get it. Like I, Again, like I said, like, I'm not really dwelling on the Toon Turtles because, Aaron, I don't know if you know this, but, like, that Toon Turtle line from NECA, there's already 42 figures out already. And they're planning, from what Randy said, to go up to, like, 145 figures. Yeah, that, that's, like the, that, that's quite a few. That's quite hey. a few. And what's the, I mean, you'll, you'll know this answer. I don't, I haven't bought any NECA recently. What's the average price of a NECA? So the average price. So as I'm looking at my, all right. So you have the, the one quarter inch scale and the one right. quarter inch scale, like the, the big tall ones. Yeah. Uh, those go for 120. Right. So 120. So I have the quarter inch scale shredder. I have the quarter inch scale foot clan soldier and the Leo and Donatello. I'm just missing Leonardo and Michelangelo for those big ones. Now, when it comes to like the 12 inch small ones, you can buy all four turtles with the 12 inch ones for like, I say like 90 bucks, 95 bucks. Okay. So you can get all four of them for like 95 bucks. Um, the most expensive ones are the quarter inch scale ones. Um, you're dropping like 120 bucks on just one of those. Yeah. 
and, so, and that's but, and that's for the movie line. Yeah. So again, I mean, you, you're talking about you know a hundred dollars, a hundred twenty dollars a figure. You know, but the super the super shredder you just bought that was like that was like thirty bucks before shipping, right? Forty bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It was thirty bucks. Uh, thirty bucks before shipping. After shipping, it was like forty bucks. Um, yeah. So that wasn't bad. I mean, I got the super shredder. I got lucky with that. I got Tokon Razar. Uh, I got lucky with that. And then um, it was Super Shredder, Toka and Raza. Oh, and the Casey and Raph 2-pack. Now, for all those people that ordered that, um, for the audience listening, remember, because uh, everybody's asking a line, I haven't got my Casey and Raph. I haven't got my Toka and Raza. Well, that's because NECA is not shipping those out till like mid-November, late November. So for all those of you listening that pre-ordered those, just keep in mind that NECA is not shipping out the Casey and Raf two pack uh, and the Tokan Raza to like mid November. So, so were you able to get a Casey and Raf? I got lucky. Oh my, Aaron. I mean, me. I mean, we did a podcast about this not too long ago. For those listening, right. go back and listen to the archive files. But man, it was like it was it was crazy you know like ordering stuff with the bots and everything but the good thing and i will say this to neca is that they pretty much catched up to what was going on so what they're doing now is that all those people that messed out on the kc talk on raza and super shredder they went back online and now people can order them without bots or anything so neca i gotta give it up to neca that they noticed what was going on, and now they're reinstating the figures on their website. So that's that's awesome. That, that's great news. I'm glad that you were able to get one because I know I, I've still been hunting. You know, I, I I go to the you know like when I was hunting for the GI Joes, I still am hunting for a few of them, but not the Target exclusives anymore. Thank God. Um, <laughs> uh, the the uh, um, I would go to Walmart's, you know, and, and I would always look at their NECA section. I have not seen one, you know, you see these pictures. I think I sent you that picture. It was that one Walmart, you know, with like 50 of those two packs. And like, I, I haven't even seen one in person, you know, and there's that guy down in Derry that, you know, he seems to get all the exclusives somehow and he's flipping them for stupid money. And, you know, it's just like, okay, but I still, I haven't even seen one. I haven't seen a super shredder in person. People have said that those have hit the stores. I haven't seen the two pack in person. So, I mean, there's still, uh, there's obviously distribution issues, but I think, um, you know, when they just did their recent podcast, um, you know, with April, um, you you know, the, the, the actress that played April O'Neill, they addressed, and I think we talked about this previously, we, they addressed those kind of issues with the box and the and the stuff, and, and you know, they're making it available to the collectors. But I also think that they have to sit there and go, okay, well, we don't want to produce, you know, produce it to demand. Like, I think, like, with the Toka, Toka and Razor, you know, they sat there and said, okay, well, we'll, we'll give you a three-week window to pre-order it. Once that window's done, then we're not going to produce any more. And I think that's a smart way to do it because then you're still keeping the collectability of the figure. You know, okay, it was limited to, you know, 10,000 figures or however many pre-orders there were. and But you're still not producing the figure. Right, right, right. And and I think, I think <laughs> you just hit the nail on the head with that, Aaron. And that's the way it should be. And I think that's the way it should be for all these pre-orders because, like, you know, you got people pre-ordering Transformers that still want the DeLorean Back to the Future Transformer. People still can't get that. I mean, like, we're living in this world now as toy collectors where it's like, listen, you got to jump on this pre-order. And also, we're living in the world where the company is telling you, hey, we're going to build this amazing Sentinel. Yeah, give us like $500, man. Oh, the Unicron. That Unicron yeah. thing was crazy because... I remember getting a text from another toy collector, one of my friends in Florida, and he was like, bro, Hasbro just put up right now that they need 600 from each person. And it was like like out of the blue. Hey, we need 600 if you want to make this. And it's like, okay, who right now can just go to their bank and just give $600? You know, and I understand these companies where it's like, look, we just can't make this toy 
produce like a thousand of them at like 600 or more because they got to pay for tooling. They got to pay for the design. They got to pay for all this stuff. And if they don't make their money back, you know, then they're screwed. But I think it's cool that if you're going to do that, like, hey, guys, we need this amount to get this done. Don't just put it out there like, hey, we need this by this date. Like, give yeah. people give people between two to three months to come up with that money because that's a big amount of money right there. So you just, you just put it on a credit card, Steve. You just put on then you then you have two to three months to pay it off. <laughs> yeah, I'll put it on on my uh, American Express black card. <laughs> yeah. So I I think, but I think that you know, for some collectors, I know that happened. Um, or they did that. I can't remember if it was a Kickstarter, but it was the big Jabba sail barge. Um, yep. You know, and they did they did it that way. But I think that that's kind of like those. You know, you're gonna have those collectors that have been wanting a giant Unicron or wanting a Java sail barge or wanting kind of that Holy grail piece, you know, that kind of, you know, that centerpiece of your collection or that kind of like, man, I'm so happy I have this in my collection, you know? And, and, and I think that that, it all boils down to, I, I think that what we talked about earlier, does it make you happy? And do you have the means, you know, um, cause if it makes you happy, then, you know, sure, you know, $600, but then the other part of me goes, well, when Hasbro released the, um, the USS flag back in the nineties, whatever it was, you know, they basically did that for cost, you know, they right. produced it. They, they were not making any money off of that toy. They did it because they knew the fans wanted it. They do. They did it because how cool would it be to have this six foot freaking aircraft carrier in your house? I mean, like, so they did that knowing that they weren't going to make any money off of it, but people were going to buy the sky strikers. People were going to buy the, the bigger vehicles so that they could put it on there. And that's where they were going to make their money. So, I mean, these toy companies are kind of being greedy asking for this money up front when, when they can sit there and go, they, you know, they confront it. Oh, they, yeah. have the money. they have the means, but they don't want to sit there and go, OK, well, we just produced 10,000 of these and now they're on clearance shelves for twenty two dollars. That's what they're right. afraid of. Right, right. Yeah. And that makes sense, man. And like you said, they did produce a USSS flag like and like, and yeah, that thing was like six feet. Like it, it will take up a whole room and. You're right. Like these toy, these toy companies do have the money to come up with this awesome stuff. But like you said, Aaron, yeah. like then you go to the store and you end up seeing these clearance deals like, hey, classified series, five dollars or right. or they end up at big lots. You know, for yeah. some reason, for some reason, big lots, you know, most of these toys end up there. I've been seeing a lot of people just like finding things in big lots lately. So. Yeah. And, and so it's funny that you mentioned that, that I was talking to somebody earlier in the week and that I guess a lot of the toy companies um, had a hard time, like just getting kind of footing be dur during this pandemic. And a lot of the companies, either the stuff got shipped out late or, it, or, you know, um, like the Walmarts and the targets like displayed it for like a week and then there was something new coming in that, you know, they almost had too much inventory or the, the market was too flooded at the time. So a lot of these toy companies were kind of scared because the, their stuff was hitting the shelves and going directly to clearance almost. And so that's why the, the, that um, I guess some of the newer toy lines didn't even happen or, or you know, uh, not didn't even happen. They, they were they weren't going to happen. Um, and almost didn't receive the backing and the funding to kind of hit the market because the toy companies were like, well, I don't want my stuff going um, in the stores for like a week and then having to go to clearance the following week, you know? And I saw that with one, I forgot one of the forums I was on. It was like, and I want to say it was the new, the new GI Joes, but like the three and three quarters inch, they weren't even supposed to be released yet. Walmart, well, some Walmart and like, Oklahoma or something got them immediately sent them to clearance. And so like wow. these like $12, $13 figures were already on clearance 
for like three dollars and fifty cents. And oh it's my like, god! Like you know, I don't know if that Walmart just messed up, but it seems like the more and more you talk to people, that that's kind of common with like these newer toys that are coming out. If they're not doing well or they don't think they're going to do well, it's almost like they're just dumping the inventory and then moving on. That is so true. Like, like, and it's true what you're saying about these other toy lines that are coming out that want their stuff on the shelves because, you know, what what I heard also, Aaron, because this is, wow, this is a good topic. Um, What I also heard was that, like, most, like, Walmarts and Targets, they'll get the shipment, let's say, G.I. Joe Classifieds. So they have, I don't know, let's say they got like three boxes of them. And instead of them taking them out that week, not all Walmarts, but most Walmarts, it just sits in the back. Then they'll take them out, but then they got to make space for these other toys. And then they go straight to uh, clearance. And, yeah. and and it's true. Like, uh, why would these toy companies, Hasbro, uh, Mattel, you know, like, why would they take a risk if... You know, they spent, let's say, eight hundred dollars to produce a toy, but then the toy that's twenty bucks goes on clearance for three dollars and fifty cents. So, <laughs> yeah, and and I think that's what they're afraid of. But I think going back to that kind of like aha, like I mean, that, I mean that Unicron's huge. You have that in your collection. That's going to be a centerpiece of your collection. Um, you know, that Jabba Sail Barge is huge. That's going to be a centerpiece of your collection. What what's the the one piece that that's like your your like piece that's like your holy grail? If, if you don't if you don't have it already, what's like that one piece that like you you you're looking for? All right, so I got a couple. <laughs> since, <laughs> since we're going into holy grail pieces, uh, I do have a couple holy grails. So number one, I'm gonna say the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, the original uh, uh, sewer layer. Um, yeah. And I would just want that complete. I just feel like that play set is so awesome. I feel like we grew up in the 80s and the 90s with amazing play sets because, like, it's a half sewer, then there's a top. And, you know, I mean, yeah, I can buy the, sh the shell on eBay. The shell, like, well, it's, even the shell is like $70. You know, but like to have that thing complete mint in box. I want this thing in the box. That would be amazing. Now, if I don't have to shell out eight hundred dollars for it, maybe two, I can do yeah. two. But eight hundred, uh, I don't know about that. But yeah, I want that. Uh, second, you know that I'm a major Voltron fan, and I love Voltron because growing up as a kid, I used to watch the show, and it was the first show where I saw, like, five lines combine into one. And yeah. I really want the Panache Place uh, Castle of Lions. Uh, I would love that complete with all the keys, uh, all the missiles on it. Like, oh, man, that would be so awesome. Like, So, yeah, number one, the Sewer Turtle Lair. Number two, uh, the Panache uh, Voltron Lair. And then for my third one, even though I have it, I want it complete. It's the Ghostbusters firehouse. I have it. It's missing a door. It's missing the sign. It's missing some stuff, but I want that in the box complete. So I feel yeah. like those three are like for toys will be like my holy grails. Um, like, and, and you know, they're play sets. They're not really figures, but if I can get those, Oh, those will be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, th I mean, I I think that for me that the the turtles lair and the Ghostbusters have a special place in my heart because I remember getting the Ghostbusters lair one Christmas and like I think I got the the sewer lair for like my birthday and I I remember dropping that little spiky ball down the sewer lair knocking you know <laughs> knocking the foot soldiers down and you know it goes into the piping and you know. Th those those are definite like you know i think like 80s 90s like kids like it just takes you back man and the ghostbusters lair you put ray on the on the on the i think i sent you that video did you check that out with yeah with you the, did I, yeah i saw that that was awesome 
he, he, the guy, he's got the, 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 the Ghostbusters firehouse and he's reenacting the scene where, from the movie where Ray slides down the pole and, and he, and he presses the button and it spins around. And I mean, like the, they don't make play sets like that anymore. Like my son's got like a PJ mass play set and a, um, what was he? The Paw Patrol t- lookout tower. Those things are junk compared to the stuff that we had. Oh yeah, play sets are not the same. They're, they're, like I look at play sets for little kids now, and I'm like, okay, like at least our play sets, you know, you had like intricate parts. The doors open, you can slide down. We had a, a lot of play sets with slime. Oh, He Man's getting slime. The Ghostbusters are getting slime. The Turtles are getting slime. Like it was just like that era. Like nobody can compete with the play sets from the 80s yeah. and 90s. It was just like amazing man but what about you Aaron? like what what's some holy grails for you i just right now it's just the one right now it's the thundercats lair that's why i said hold off on this <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's just the thundercats lair um i have the mumra fortress i was able to piece that together um over the years uh, which was awesome and um yeah right it's just the the, the cat's lair i mean I don't even care if it's pieces. I don't care if it's parts. I just want the bulk of it to be there. Kind of like, you know, what you're saying with like your Ghostbusters firehouse. I don't care if it's missing a door. I just want it to be kind of like the bulk of it. So I can put Lionel in front of it, kind of standing up with the sort of omens. Um, but I mean, I, I can't justify dropping, you know, six to 600 to a thousand dollars on a Thundercats layer right now. Um, you know, uh, that's kind of like the one thing that I want to walk up at the flea market and just see it and then like freak the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and like it was like um, I told you a couple of years ago when I found the um, the Channel 6 news van. Um, yep. You know, I mean, some guy just had that at the flea market. It was sitting down on the ground with like a Ghostbusters case. And I asked him how much he wanted for it. And he's like, how about five bucks for both? And I was like, OK. And I took that some bitch and I ran back to my car <laughs> and I put it in my car. And, you know, it was missing like two parts. I was able to grab those parts off of eBay. But to get a uh, Channel 6 news van for five dollars is unheard of, you know, um, that is amazing. But- yeah, I th- I think uh, you know if I can find a good deal on a uh, on a, um, a Thundercats layer, and it was funny, you know, we were talking to a couple friends, you know, uh, my wife and I, and you know, we, I was saying, you know, I th- I don't know how the conversation came up, but the conversation came up about you know like oh well you know Aaron you don't need any more toys, and I said well. There's one thing that I still need. <laughs> and I said, I said, that's the Thundercats lair. And, you know, I kind of showed, showed my wife some eBay prices and her, her eyes got real big and <laughs> she looked like she was going to kill me. I haven't bought anything yet. So, uh, you know, I'm still in the safe zone. But no, I think that's the, the one thing that, you know, if I saw that, that would kind of complete my Thundercats collection. No, that's awesome, man. And, and you know what? Thundercats is an amazing like line like just like because isn't the thundercats is it the layer that has the eyes that glow red yeah so the the eye the eyes it has a light bulb in it the eyes are supposed to light up um i the the mouth lights up too because it has the the lasers that shoot out of the mouth um and but it it was kind of like that 80s 90 or no it was definitely 80s sorry 80s um like technology with like the lasers, like a lot of um, toy companies were using that. Like I know Brave Star was doing it. Um, Thundercats was doing it where you can kind of shoot these infrared lasers. So there was this like attacks. It was almost like a, a play set, but it had like a game aspect to it. So somebody controlled the head of the Thundercats lair and could shoot at this attack sled. And the attack sled had this like shield that would fall down and then the attack sled could shoot at the lair, and if you hit the button on the lair enough times, the door the doors would bust open. That's awesome, man. That is okay. Going back again to the way playsets were back then for us, that is like amazing. Like, like, and again, they don't make playsets like that. And you know, Thundercast is a line where it has gone up tremendously in prices. Yeah. I mean, just the other day, I saw a cheetah. And I think with no weapons, no nothing, just the bare bones, 
it was like twenty three dollars, and uh, I was just I think, like, yeah, I think they're more than that now. I mean, Ch- Chitara, Chitara is kind of one of the the more sought after figures, um, but I think. Let me see. Yeah, I'm looking on eBay right now. It looks like yeah. forty dollars. Forty dollars is kind of wow. like the go. Wow, forty dollars. That that and that's just one vintage figure. You know. That, yeah. It looks, that, that, yeah, it looks like a complete one. Um, with that bow staff. That bow staff is like reproduced like crazy. Um, you know. So if you have an original staff, it looks like 110 to 130 dollars just with her and the bow staff. Wow, wow. And again, Aaron, it's like we were talking about like this hobby, this toy collecting hobby, it could be an expensive thing. But again, you can make it work. Like you were saying before, Aaron, like if you just buy the shell and you get the pieces later or you buy the figure at the flea market for like three, four bucks and you can buy the parts later or you could be like me where I'm just like, I got the figure. I don't really care too much about the accessories, but I will say this. When it comes to turtles, I don't need all the accessories, but like I had the backpack for Casey Jones. You sold me the weapons. Um the the secret of the ooze, uh nineteen ninety one uh playmate turtles, like I, I would like the accessories to that. Um yeah. but like all these other figures, like I don't need all the accessories. Like, you know, as long as I have the figure itself, like I'm fine. And you know, turtles I'm looking at my shelf right now, and there's just so, so many that I've gotten to the point where, like, all right, I want the Turtle 2, Secret of the Ooze Turtles, got them. I got the complete first wave, got them. I got some of the mutation ones. I still need a few. Let me get those. Let me get some of the Toon Turtles, but I cannot sit here and collect every single turtle from like 88 to like 97 when the line ended. Yeah. And I think I remember um, the past couple of weeks I've been bringing um, some trade stuff to Dave and you were like, yeah, he, I brought some turtles and you were like, Aaron, why are you, you know, this guy, you know, this, this guy's really hard to find. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Steve, I don't care. Like, I mean, yeah, it might be hard to find, you know, sure. You can go on eBay and, and buy one, you know, but you're going to pay a mint for it. But I, I, I just, I don't, I can't collect every single turtle. There's a, you know, like you said, the original line for some reason, Ace Duck has a, a special um, place in my heart. I, I remember playing with him as a kid quite a bit. Um, you know, the Baxter Stockman's, you know, I mean, I have those complete, I, I think the later lines um, I didn't really get too into, but like the one that had like, and th- they're stupid expensive right now, but the universal monsters um, line, I think that those are awesome. So I have a couple of those. And then obviously, you know, like the tune turtles, like I just wanted the the news team um, to go with the, the news van. But I mean, other than that, I mean, I have most of the turtles pieces that I'm looking for. So unless it's like something mint in box that I can just kind of add to the collection, then, you know, I'm, I'm fine with getting a Lucy here or a Lucy there. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way as you, Aaron. And it's funny cause I have a shelf of, of obscure turtle stuff. Like, I have, like, a, let me see, uh, Donatello lamp from 1988, a Burger King Kids Club, like, pin with Michelangelo, a puzzle, uh, a cup. So I have this little shelf of just, like, obscure, you know, just, like, they made everything turtles back then, as you know, Aaron. Like, everything was turtles, erasers, pencils, uh, napkins, underwear, you know, it's like... I, I I will not be buying used underwear from the flea market. That's for sure. So <laughs> I was about to say you got your your Ninja Turtle underoos on over there. <laughs> Are you doing the podcast? Hey Aaron, check out my new turtle undies that I'm wearing right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll check out your Instagram after the show. <laughs> hey, but, uh, you had a great topic too. Um, since we were since we were talking about toys. And collecting toys, I know that you had a topic about also collecting. Oh, the yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that kind of feeds into like you know that we're talking about like the crazy prices, but like the yeah the the video game collecting. I mean, retro video game collecting right now is just is just nuts. I mean, uh, I don't know what it is. Prices are going through the roof. 
Um, I know both you and I, we were looking at that, that one guy's um, lot. I, he posted it on Facebook, you know, the night before or whatever, brought it to the flea market, you know, and he's like, oh, Nintendo with like 20, 20 games, but they're like, you know, nothing to write home about games, $250, you know, and he's like, I'm not separating it. I'm not, you know, if you don't buy it, somebody's on their way right now and is going to buy it, you know, and it's like, okay, dude. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I, relax. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I just, I can't, I mean, we talked about this before when you go to the flea market. I mean, I get there early, you get there early. Dave gets there super early. Yeah. Um, you know, you see that you see the same, you know, people that are out there hunting, you know, doing the same thing we are, you know, the toy hunters, but I mean, the video game hunters are even more ruthless <laughs> than I would say the toy hunters. I mean, it is, yeah. it is crazy, you know? And I mean, I talk, I, I'm friendly with a few of them, you know, cause I mean, I collect retro video games too. I think, I think my, my, uh, my drive right now, my, you know, the thing I, you know, collecting more of is, uh, toys. But like, if somebody said, Oh, here's an in uh, vintage Nintendo for $5, I'm not going to pass that up. You know? Yeah. I, same here. Same here. I think that, you know, the, the, the retro video game collectors market right now is just crazy. I mean, there's games that, you know, used to be $30, $40 games all day long, you know, like the GameCube games like Super Mario Sunshine and, you know, a couple things like that. I mean, these things retailed for $60, $50, $60 when they came out. They're going for almost $100. Yeah, that is, it, that is insane. And it's not like they're obscure games. I mean, they produced millions of copies of these games. So, I mean, are they good games? Yes, but they're not rare by any means. They're not like a scratch Ninja Turtle. You know what I mean? That, that, but some of these games are going for $120, $130, $140, and it's one game. And you're like going, what is going on? I'm just waiting for that bubble to pop. Yeah, man. And it's like, like you said, Aaron, like we know most of the people are at the flea market. I think there's more video game hunters than the toy hunters because I pretty much met most of the toy hunters. There's me, there's you, this guy Mike that does like He-Man's, uh, and there's these Alex, and there's three more other guys who are actually that I see all the time. Now, the video game guys, those guys, they come in groups because we see yeah. the same guy with the backpack. I see him there right. every Sunday. He's there. Um, then I see these two other guys that are just looking for like retro games. I like, I, I think one morning I bumped into at least five of them and they came yeah. in a group and they were all spread out, just looking for stuff together as a group hunting together. And it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy because listen, right now I have a Nintendo. I have a Sega Genesis, a PlayStation two, a PlayStation three, uh, a PS4, a switch, um, I don't have a Super Nintendo. I'm looking for one because right now I play my Super Nintendo games on my Retron 3, which plays all three consoles, Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and Super Nintendo. Um, so that's where I play my Super Nintendo games. But Aaron, let's be honest about the NES. There was 700 and something games, not including the Japanese. Not every game on a Nintendo was a hit. No, most of the games suck. Yeah, I like, mean... 75% yeah. of their library was shit. <laughs> like, yeah. like it was shit. Like, okay, you have your classics, Super Mario 1. If you're a collector, you need that. Super Mario 2, Super Mario 3, you need those games. You need the games like Zelda, you know, Metroid, those classic games. Uh, the Disney games on Nintendo were amazing. DuckTales, uh, Tailspin, Darkwing Duck, uh, Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Uh, yeah. You know, th those are great games. All the Capcom games, Mighty Final Fight, Mega Man, uh, you know, like there are those battle toads like there's those games that, yeah, having those collection. But are you going to have fucking 1942, which was like that, right. like, you know, like like Akari Warriors is a good one. But like I'm talking about like those cheap Sesame Street, uh, 
you know, there's a lot, like, especially those LGN games. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my. Somebody shoot me because, listen, LGN, they made great toys. But when it came to the licenses of video games, they sucked. Now, Aaron, have you played the Back to the Future game on NES? I, I, I've, I haven't played that one per se, but I've played other LJN games. And like you said, they, they were, I mean, LJN, you, you're talking to a Thundercats collector. So LJN is holding holding a special place in my heart. But man, <laughs> they, 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 they did not, they did not want to make uh, video games. I mean, I think they, I think they just stretched themselves out too thin. But no, I didn't play, I haven't played the Back to the Future game. Oh my God, the game had nothing to do with the movie, just like the other LGN games. Like you play as Marty McFly and then you're collecting birds, collecting. I'm just like, this has nothing to do with Back to the Future. And that's what I'm saying about the NES line. I mean, there are guys out there that want to complete the whole collection. But like Aaron, we all know about those holy, holy grail titles that oh, if yeah. you want to complete, your NES collection, you're going to shell out $200,000 or more. Yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah, there, there, there's definitely some expensive titles. I mean, I, I, I don't, um, I know stadium events is one of them. Yep, um, that's one I, of them. Stadium I events. Have, I haven't seen, um, I know there's a PAL version that is, uh, more, I guess, easier to acquire. Um, but the, the U S version is kind of like that Holy grail. Now, I mean, people can say like, Oh, well, I'm going to go for a, you know, complete collection of the NES. And, and they're going to say, well, if you don't have a Nintendo world championships cart, then, you know, you don't have a complete collection. Well, technically the Nintendo world championships cart was not a game. It was a collection of games. Um, but it was never, you know, release to the public, you know? So yeah, I just looked the PAL version of, um, stadium events just sold for a thousand dollars, but I, I see that there's a uh, complete or a, a, uh, complete in box one that I, I haven't seen a recent copy, but I know that they can go for, you know, 20,000 plus, um, you know, for a uh, complete in box U S version of stadium events. That is insane, man. And like for those listening right now, I know we talk a lot about toys, but Aaron just mentioned the Nintendo World Championships and what that was. That was in 1990 and Nintendo did this competition where they were touring like 30 American cities. And then, um, they, you know, they got the best of the best Nintendo players. And then all those players, which were us the kids back then. Um, you know, I think the finals were at Universal Studios and yeah. the winner uh, that won the Nintendo World Championship, uh, he won three of them, actually, was Jeff Hansen. Now, this kid was 11 and he won three Nintendo World Championships. And those cards, the, the NWC cards, for those that don't uh, know too much about retro video game collecting, uh, the cards themselves, uh, now if I'm mistaken, I think there's only like 200 of them at the wild, and they're each numbered. And all the cards were were a Super Mario game, which you had to beat the first level at a certain amount of time, um, and like four other games. And that's literally what it was. It was just a card with these games when when you popped it in it told the competitor what they had to do in each game yeah yeah i think it was three games um i and i know it was mario um uh, i can't remember what i want to say the second was like rad racer or something and like the, the third one was tetris i remember that and i like there was a, there's a really good documentary on netflix that kind of talks about the Nintendo world championships and how, you know, this one kid just basically, you know, he was like, the goal is to get the Tetris as soon as possible. Um, and I guess there was a strategy involved. I think the first, the Mario was like collect a hundred coins or collect 50 coins. I think that was a thing, but basically what they were was it was a modded cart. It had a couple dip switches on it. And, um, they, they, um, you know, they were great carts. Uh, I think you, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that there was two fifty. 
um, because they're, they're individually numbered. And I think that they found a 200 plus cart. So I think there's guesstimated there's 250. They only think about a quarter of them, maybe, maybe less than definitely less than half are still out there. You know, kid, parents probably threw them out, donated them. Maybe they're still in people's basement somewhere. Maybe they're still, you know, wherever, but there's only, there's only, uh, I think just under a hundred known to exist that, that actually are on record. And then the, that's the gray carts, the gold carts, was a um, Nintendo Power giveaway because they had some extras and they basically um, reshelled them with a Zelda cart and put a new sticker on it. That's the gold one, right? Yeah, so the gold one was... The, those are a little bit more hard to find um, because I think there was only like 50 or 100 of those and it was a, it was a Nintendo um, Power giveaway you just had to mail your your uh, name and information in, and if you won, you won, and you got mailed one of those gold carts. Wow, that's that that is wow, that's crazy, man. So yeah, like imagine that, Aaron. Like, hey, you don't have a complete collection because you don't have an NWC cart. So yeah. hey, man, hey, man, yeah. your collection is not cool, man. So yeah. you know, it, it's 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 insane, man. Hey, were you a Nintendo kid or a Sega kid, by the way? Uh, Nintendo. I, I was definitely, I, I, I remember, I remember playing an NES at a very young age. I think one of the, um, best games, the two, the two games that I remember playing the mo most are, were Batman and, um, GI Joe. Those were like the two games that I just played the hell out of. And then, you know, I remember getting my first su Super Nintendo and I was playing like Mario Kart on like a little, 10 inch black and white TV. <laughs> you know? And cause I didn't have a color TV at the time. And it was just a little, I remember, I remember it was like a little white. I didn't even have a stand for it. I kind of like laid on the ground on my stomach and like played and like stared at a little 13 inch TV. That is hilarious, man. But that, that, that's just classic. Yeah. I had a, I had a Nintendo as a kid. I, I didn't have a super Nintendo, but I went over kids house that had them. Uh, yeah. I had a Sega Genesis, and I remember those Sega commercials when Nintendo and Sega Genesis, it was like the retro console wars as a kid, and the commercial was like, Genesis does what Nintendo don't. I just yeah. remember all those commercials, man. Those were those were classics, man. But yeah, man, I'm like you, Aaron. Like, if, I, if, if in the wild I come into a game and I'm like, oh, Battletoads for five bucks, I'll pick it up. Why right. not? You know, but am I really searching? I'm more of a toy guy, but yeah, I have I have retro systems in my living room, and I got yeah. a, I got a couple games, retro games. But am I quote unquote an actual retro game collector? No, because I'm I'm just a casual gamer. So, right, yeah, and I think that that was I, I definitely have quite a bit of collections because that was that was kind of like my forte for a while. That's all I was doing was doing like retro gaming stuff but mainly focusing on like like the one i'm focusing on the most right now is nintendo 64 i have a lot of the titles that i that i want but it's the the finding the boxes i think i got to that point where i bought one box and i was like oh that looks nice <laughs> and then it's like oh now i need to buy more boxes and so just finding like the empty boxes and like paying stupid prices on ebay for like empty boxes um, is just, you know, you're paying for a piece of freaking cardboard, but you know, it's, uh, you know, it adds, it adds that nostalgia, you know, and it adds that, you know, fun to it. So, yeah. Um, I, I would, I would still consider myself a retro game collector, but it, it, I, I know that if, if I, if I see it, I'll pick it up, but it's, I think the one thing I'm more actively searching out right now is the, um, like the toys. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree on you. I agree 100% on you on that. And like for me, what I'm really looking for right now when it comes to retro game collecting, I do want a Nintendo, a Nintendo box. The, the system doesn't need doesn't need to be in it. I just want to display the box. Yeah, a Super, a Super Nintendo box and a Sega Genesis box. Those are the only boxes I need. And a power glove would be cool to have and Rob the Robot. I mean, yeah. Those are like the four things that I would love to have just as like display. So and see, 
I like I, I think this will be the last part of this and then we'll move on. But like the Rob the Robot, that was the dumbest game. It was horrible. <laughs> It was it, it went with Gyromite, and I think it played with like one other game, but it it basically you had to try to control this robot to like make the guy move and like whatever. Cool concept, horrible. I, the thing moved slow as hell. It it you know it had all these little parts and pieces and whatever. And you want to talk about like it, it kind of became like a little bit of a almost like a mascot for Nintendo f- during you know during the time you know it was like oh look Rob the robot you know it was like this cool little accessory and I mean I think I want one just to kind of display it on like a toy shelf because it, I think it almost looks more like a toy than a video game you know character you know but it, it, like it was horrible it, it like you know for somebody for like a kid today. If you sat my son down and tried to get him to play Rob the Robot, he'd look at you like he's you're freaking nuts, you know. <laughs> it, it's 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 very it's very hard to play. It's not really functional, and sure, it, it might entertain a, a kid or somebody that's into like mechanical engineering for a few minutes, but it, it's it's definitely was a poor 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 um, video game. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that, man. But yeah, Aaron. So what? What's our next? Uh, I'm looking forward so, to our next. This one. This one's ra- totally random. I think it's kind of fun. I, you and I kind of like talked about it um, briefly at the um, flea market. I kind of just throw it out as like a joke, and you were like, "No, no, 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 no!" Like, let's run with it. And I was like, "Okay, sure." Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I sent that picture, and I was like, "Okay, like th- I think we could do this." So kind of like the top five like female characters that you kind of like maybe had a crush on as a kid like in cartoons or like characters that like now as an adult you look back on the the art style and you're like oh boy (laughs) somebody was um you know somebody was gearing this towards a different audience (laughs) (laughs) hey and just for all the audience listening right now listen man this isn't our like fetish, you know, like we're into like <laughs> female cartoon thank, thank characters. You, thank you for thank you for clearing that, Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like like me and Aaron, like we're not coming home at night and like shutting off all the lights with a candle burning, like, all right, let me check out this wit jigglypuff, you know, from Pokemon. <laughs> you know, like that that's not no, we're we're just we're just doing this, you know, for fun. And you know, I I, I just want to clear that because if there's any SJWs or Karens listening, listen, you know, like obviously these are cartoon characters. So, <laughs> so oh, that's great. So, um, uh, do you want to start? Do I want to start? I, I don't know. Now, uh, now you kind of made me feel all dirty since you kind of. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's cool. That's cool. Um, all right. Yeah, I can start, man. So I made my top five, uh, and, you know, Aaron, we're going to come out with a name for these top fives, man. Um, uh, maybe down the next podcast we'll have a name. But so today we're naming our top five female characters in cartoons. And uh, on my number five, I have Velma Dinkley from Scooby-Doo. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, why do I have Velma? Well, because there's something about, like, the glasses and the freckles and something about like she's nerdy she's the smart one but there is something underneath the surface you know (laughs) yeah there's something about her you know and like there's something about like nerdy girls that that's just like cool you know what i'm saying like just a nerdy girl that's cute you know and I know there's more to that cuteness underneath there. You know, there's, there, there's somebody, uh, let me not say that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, digging, you're digging yourself a hole, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Let me not, let me not put myself in the grave, but yeah. <laughs> number five, <laughs> number five for me is Velma Dinkley. So. All right. All right. My, my number five, um, uh, is, uh, Bulma from Dragon Ball Z. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, taking it back, taking it back. I think 
I, it was something it was I think Master Roshi probably kind of like jaded me a little bit because he was so obsessed with her in the show. And it was like he was always trying to like sneak in like, you know, like sneak a little peek of like Bulma, you know, during the uh, during the episodes. But, you know, she was always kind of like that cool heroine. You know, she had all the gadgets. She had all the, um, you know, the capsule core stuff. And I, I always I always thought that she was kind of like that cool character. But there was all, always that, you know, kind of like finesse to her, you know, in, in the show. And and it was something about how Master Roshi was always trying to, like, sneak a little something. And then she would be in like a little skirt and you'd be like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 that's awesome that's a good that that's a good choice for your number five i, I like that choice aaron yeah uh, okay so here we go with our number four so for number four i picked baroness from gi joe okay now, okay <laughs> i'm trying not to so, laugh so let, let me let me let me stop you there because that's my number two so, <laughs> so we, we we got we got two on the same list you know what's funny? As they're saying that's your number two, I know there's somebody listening right now to this show. Like, wait a minute, she's on my mind right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> somebody's thinking about the same female character. Now, why did I pick Baroness? Okay, so as a kid, I was I would watch GI yeah, Joe. Obviously, I was I was young at the time, but like you know, those thoughts were in my mind. I thought she was awesome uh, for Cobra. But as an adult now and watching these fan art of Baroness, she's pretty much a dominatrix. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Black leather, glasses. <laughs> it's almost like a dominatrix librarian. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's that like, you know, I hate to say this, but it's that like really bad porno movie where like the guy's at a library and he's like, excuse me. I'm looking for the art section and like Baroness just like turns around from her chair with like those sexy glasses and that tight dominatrix, <laughs> you know, Well, she's, she's got the, she's got the bad accent too. She's got the Russian accent. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be perfect for, <laughs> there's a lot of scenarios running through my mind right now. <laughs> and so, <laughs> oh goodness that's funny I, that's funny. i'm glad i'm glad that i said what i said before we started this so yeah yeah so it, it's it's i was i was gonna say this right at, right before you started uh with your number four but i was like i wonder if if there's any that, that are gonna overlap and that's funny that you know that we both had one on the same list oh man what what's what who do you have for number four i'm curious Aaron. So my number four right now is um, Cammy from Street Fighter. Oh, now, now that is a good one. Now, <laughs> I don't know who, who, who the artist was on Cammy, um, but, um, you know, given her that Borat, Borat swimsuit, um, before <laughs> and, and putting the tattoos on her legs and stuff like that. I mean, I, immediately, I, I can't remember what, I think she came out in Street Fighter 3 or uh, Street Fighter 4, but I mean, when you, when, when that character select screen, when Cammy popped up, it was like, whoa, okay, <laughs> like, this, they're, they're taking this shit to the next level. Those Japanese artists, man, they they really know how to shape a woman in these characters, man. And I mean, she was she was Guile's, you know, kind of secret weapon, and you know, she kind of had the uh, uh, beret on her head. But I mean, she she had the beret on her head, but she wasn't like she didn't have any pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I sound like a dirty old man right now. <laughs> I know. That's what I said. Like this is this is probably a bad idea, but we're hell. We're we're knee deep in it anyway. So. Hey, who cares? This is our podcast. We talk about whatever the hell we want. <laughs> <laughs> so, who cares? All uh, right, that's, who's, that's, who's that's, number that's, three. Aaron, that's a good choice, man. All right, so <laughs> my number three was going to be a Street Fighter character, but I would mention her as an honorable mention later. But I'm gonna pick April O'Neil okay. for my number three. Oh, that, and that, that's like that's like your Homer pick. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know what? Like April, she's a newscaster, you know. So she's a working woman. She works for herself. She's independent, you know. But also that tight, 
yellow mustard looking, you know, suit. Uh, yeah, I'm really digging that. And again, as a kid, I didn't have these thoughts. But as an adult now, you know, again, I see this fan art. And man, these fan artists are drawing April O'Neil. And I, let me just say this. When she has that zipper unzipped just a little bit at the top, <laughs> my, my, my. Like, I know that her jumpsuit is made out of mustard, but can somebody pour some mustard on that for me? <laughs> because... <laughs> Oh my goodness! The, the the internet has corrupted our minds. You know, with, without without the internet, we wouldn't we wouldn't have these ideas because there wouldn't be this fan, this fan art. I just want to have an April O'Neil hot dog. That's all I want to have. <laughs> oh goodness! That's, oh man! I was going to ask. I was I was well, like Megan when Megan Fox portrayed her. Did that kind of fulfill that for you? <laughs> You know what? I, I'm not going to, you know what? Megan Fox is hot, but like, I, I wasn't feeling her as April O'Neil. She's just, no. she was just, she was just eye candy for the movie. That's it. So. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so my number three is actually from a, um, from a video game and it's um, Tifa from Final Fantasy seven. Oh, nice, nice, nice. So, I mean, she was kind of more of that like badass, you know, like you know but i think it was kind of like the like you said it was those those not really fan arts i mean because i mean when you watch final fantasy 7 i mean the cutscenes were awesome but like that boxy style but it was like when they when they remade the the final fantasy 7 and made it into the movie and then they started really getting into the cgi i don't know man those something about those freaking suspenders and like she's like a boxer yeah i mean i always i always thought that like like as a kid, you're like, oh shit! You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's something there's something about it. I mean, but the, seeing the 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 remakes and and I think I mean a lot of that stuff. You know, we saw these characters as kids, and you know, as you grow up, you're like, you know, the obviously there's adults, you know, illustrating them, but like, I mean, you gotta kind of wonder, like, what 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 was their uh, you know, kind of mo when they're <laughs> when they're making these characters. Ob- obviously, sex sells, but holy shit, you know. Hey, listen, I'm looking at some pictures right now, and she's wearing some little short shorts with a little tank top, and oh man, like, and it's it's like you said, like, listen, it's these guys. Guys are the ones that are like, you know, coming up with these female character bodies, and. You know, with these graphics looking so realistic, I'm just like, my, my, my. She, she can kick my ass any day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tifa from Final Fantasy. W- what's your, uh, what's it called when they call like monsters? Um, uh, uh, what is it in Final Fantasy when they're calling like their, uh, like I know Cloud has the Knights of the Round Table. Yeah, it was it was summons. It summons. Was, yeah, it was summons, man. but it was um. God, I want, what the hell were they called? Listen, um, let's, I just want to get summons by Tifa. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can summons yeah. me anytime. Uh, I knew. I know it's in Final Fantasy VII. It was Materia, and then they summoned. I forgot what those guys were called. Now, now that's bothering me. <laughs> Oh my God, that's a good. That is that is a good one. I think you're gonna be surprised with my number two, Aaron. All right, go ahead. All right, all right. So for my number two, and I'm gonna explain why I have her as my number two. I have Betty Boo as my number two. Okay. Okay. All now, right. here is the reason why I have Betty Boo. I have this thing. It's funny that I'm saying this on the podcast right now. <laughs> so there's this. <laughs> Go ahead, I, have, go ahead. I have this thing right where Betty Boo was like a pin, uh, pin up, you know, like kind of like cartoon character. And in the 50s and 40s and 60s, you have pin up girls. And, you know, there's something about pin up girls and, and those women from back in the days. There's a there's a sex appeal to them. Yeah. And, you know, the makeup. Um, just the way they look, their hair. And I think for me, what it is, is that 
Nowadays, you have Playboy. You have all this. Uh, if you know, you have the internet. You want to look at stuff, just type it in. You'll find it on the internet. But yeah. back, but back then, growing up, you know, in the fifties and stuff, and in the forties, like you had these pinup girls, and you know, they weren't showing a lot of flesh, but your mind is telling you, mm, what is under there? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know, it it was that curious sense of like. These women are so beautiful, but they're not even showing anything. And Betty Boo just reminds me of that, like that 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 cartoon character. So that's yeah. why I have her as my number two because she's from that era, and I I, I just love it. And and that's why I love that era, man, of like pinup girls and stuff. No, definitely. I mean, there there was definitely an and it was almost almost like an art style, you know. When as soon as you said pinup girls, I think of kind of like the old war planes that had like you know um, kind of you know women you know in you know provocative clothing, you know, or or you know they weren't nude, you know, they were just kind of painted, you know, like you said, you know. But it was kind of like hmm, you know, that that wonder, you know, and they were painted on the sides of like the uh, the the fighter jets, or they were painted on the bombs, or you know, whatever. But I mean, the, the, I think that pinup style is, is fantastic. I mean, you kind of see you, you, it's, it's something that has been lost with the, um, you know, with, with the time and kind of the, the technology, you know, nowadays you, you, you freaking just, you know, open up an app, you know, an Instagram or TikTok or whatever. And you're, you're like, Holy shit. You know, I think, I think people, <laughs> yeah. If, if you if you if you went back in time and, and and gave somebody a cell phone in the 1940s and showed them, showed them what was really going on, they'd be like, oh my god, there's <laughs> there's, there's there's nothing left to the imagination. Um, no, you're so right. I definitely I definitely hear you on that. I mean that that definitely makes a lot of sense about that kind of like, huh? You know that that I wonder. You know, and, <laughs> yeah. And and it, it was I read this. I read this meme today and it was, it was like, uh, I, I can't remember how it went, but it just kind of brought me back to that. It was like, you know, years ago, you know, my grandfather wrote, you know, wrote a love letter longer than most essays. And here you are sending, uh, sending naughty photos to, to get, you know, girls to, to get their attention, you know, and it was kind of like, it was, it was so true. It's like, you know, that, that it's lost in kind of time that kind of like chivalrous, you know, kind of like, you know, he, you know, ha, you don't need to show a lot of skin to make somebody kind of wonder, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely, man, definitely. But I am curious right now to see what's well, your number two. Well, I already told you, my, the, uh, there was a spoiler earlier. My number two was the Baroness. I, it was something, I mean, and kind of the same reasons for you. Um, you know, it was that, you know, that, that kind of, <laughs> I think it was the leather outfit. I think that's what it was, you know, but it was something about that, that kind of like that accent that, that, you know, I don't know, Russian accents. I, I don't know why it, it's just kind of like, hmm, okay. You know, but it, it's, uh, it's just something, I don't know. I think it's kind of like, you know, if you look at kind of my pick so far, it's almost like that, the, the power, you know, I, I like, it's the kind of like the, 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 the women figures that can, that, that have like some sort of like strength to them, you know, like, it's yeah. not like kind of the weak kind of girly it's, it's, it, they have, they, they can definitely kick your ass, you know? That's awesome, man. Yeah. It's funny that we both had, uh, the same, the same person and you have it for, for, for number two. Yeah. Now, Aaron, yeah. if you have the same one that I have for number one, Okay, before we get to our number one, before we yeah. finish this list off, I was talking to some people and they were like, hey, Steve, what are you doing for the podcast this week? I'm like, you know, top five female characters, right? And yeah. they were like, oh, that's awesome. Who's your top five? And every person that I mentioned mentioned this person as their number one. That's on my okay. number one. Okay. This was the same, like every person that I spoke to set this person as their number one for female character. All right. Uh, I, I, have a, I have a feeling who it is because that, that's probably going to be my honorable mention. But I want to I, I want to say we don't have the same number one. I want to okay. I want to make. Yeah. OK. OK. Because I also have. Can I try to guess your number one if that's the case? You can definitely check because I think you already know who it is, man. 
I, I, if you're, I mean, if it's this popular character that you're saying, I, I'm going to say Jessica Rabbit. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Jessica Rabbit. And I mean, like, you hit the nail on the head, Aaron. It's like everybody that I mentioned this to, it was Jessica Rabbit. I mean, like, yeah. listen, I am not going to lie. When she came out, <laughs> when she came out, and, and it's crazy that this is a Disney movie. Yeah. Okay. When Bob Hoskins went to the nightclub, and he's sitting down having a drink, and Jessica Rabbit comes out to sing, and she starts singing that song called Why Don't You Do Right, that 1922 yeah. song, and she's like, you let other women make a fool of you? Why don't you do right like some other men do? And I'm just, like, melting in my seat because I'm like, this woman is... Now, again, everybody listening, I know that she's a cartoon, okay? I know that she's a cartoon, but my man, like these Disney animators were like, we're going to get Jessica Rabbit to look so gorgeous and amazing. And it's just like they hit the nail on the head. And it's funny that you knew she was number one. And everybody else that I mentioned who either grew up in the 80s or in the 90s mentioned her, too, as their number one. And Jessica Rabbit, you are my number one and you will always be my number one because when I saw you. Man, I wish I was what Roger Rabbit when she picked them up and rubbed them all over. I was like, why can't I be that damn rabbit right now? And it's and it's funny that that came from a Disney movie. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure, you know, because if you're taking your kid to a Disney movie, you are not expecting that. You know what I mean? And this one, I mean, it was it was a Disney movie, but it was a it was a live action slash animated. But uh, I think the best line is she says in the movie, I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. She does say that in the line. Yeah, oh, yeah. my God. That's that's awesome. man. But yeah, man, Jessica Rabbit. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Uh, she is my she is my number one for top female character. So I am so curious. OK, yeah. Aaron, I am so curious right now to find out what your number one is, because if you already knew that Jessica Rabbit was my number one, I can't wait to hear what your number one is. So so I, I kind of yeah, I kind of teased it. And probably I think that's what sparked um, the, this kind of topic uh, a couple couple weeks ago or, you know, last week. I sent you that picture um, in the in the um, in the group chat of the Sentinel. And uh, so that kind of got me thinking of kind of like 90s cartoons. And in that Sentinel, it's like, or, <laughs> you know, who's who's in that picture? It was Rogue from X-Men. Ah, that's a and, great pick, actually. I mean, Rogue. 90s animated X-Men Rogue. It will just whoa, <laughs> just whoa. I mean, I think that um, that green jumpsuit, um, yep. the you know, green it, yellow jumpsuit, yeah, that the, 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 the Cajun accent, you know, how you know, how her and Gambit, you know, I mean, the the white hair, just the whole freaking package. But you know, I think going back on it, and I'm looking at my list now, and I kind of said it before, it was like that that power thing. I mean, she was a freaking badass. you know, she had the looks, but I mean, she could back up the looks with, with, um, you know, her, her strength and, you know, in the cartoon, you know, series, she had that super strength, but then she can, you know, steal whoever's strength she touches, but God almighty, oh, whoever, whoever was drawing her, um, you know, in that, in that jumpsuit, you know, was, uh, <laughs> they, they had some, they had some ideas. Aaron, I'm looking at a picture of Rogue from 1990, and you're right. Uh, whoever was drawing her. But right now, with that green, like, uniform really tied on her, I just want to, like, I wish Rogue was an M&M, like, in a bowl of <laughs> M&Ms, and she's the green one. And I just want to, like, just just throw her in my mouth right now. Like, I'm going to eat you up like some M&Ms right now, Rogue. Oh. You can take, oh, listen, man. Rogue. I know you're a cartoon character, but if you're listening to this, which I know you're probably not because you're a cartoon character, you can take my powers 
anytime. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Steve, you, you're starting to sound like you're going to do a, a weird science moment. You're going to go get a rogue action figure and, you know, put a put a put a bra on your head and hook her up to a computer and try to make it real. <laughs> if we can do that, Aaron, oh, my. Can you imagine if right now, like it was like weird science and like our top five female characters just came out right now? <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting in a we're sitting in a dark room with bras on our head and, and, and you know you know putting uh putting the dolls on the little uh the little uh, leads and zapping them and oh man <laughs> oh man man listen Aaron this was so much fun yeah this was fun definitely. we definitely. are definitely I, doing I, top fives yeah and and next week it won't be as provocative, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for those listening, listen, this was just like, you know, you know, we came up with the steak, you know, and listen, again, these are cartoon characters, people. They're not real. You know, we appreciate women. We're not degrading women. You know, we have girlfriends, we have wives, you know, these are fake characters. There's there is no chance. You know that Aaron will like fly away with Rogue, and there's no chance that I would just get with Jessica Rabbit and go to Toonland. All right, so <laughs> I don't, I don't know, I don't know, Steve. You don't have your list. <laughs> the, the the list of uh, uh, so I I think it what, what was it? It was a Friends episode, or it was something where it was like the list. You know. Oh. And, and, yes. and it was like if these if these five celebrities ever said, you know, hey, you know, you got one night. Let's go. You, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so oh, I know my, I know my wife and I years ago, we kind of like joked around about that, you know, because I think we were watching the show and we were like, hmm, who would be on your list? You know, and it's it, it, it would be funny. Like, so all of a sudden this cartoon character comes out of nowhere. Yo, she's on my cartoon list. <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Like the cartoon character comes out and then like you're just walking back and your wife's like, Aaron, Aaron. And you're like, yes, honey. What's all that green paint all over you? I know you weren't. I know you weren't painting the house this morning. <laughs> <laughs> or or you could just go to uh, uh, Universal Studios and Marvel Land and hope that Rogue shows up <laughs> like a, a live action character playing Rogue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this was amazing, man. Oh, this was like one of the best podcasts so far. This was awesome, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Listen, man, Matt, Aaron, we did some great topics today. Yeah. Uh, this was like so much fun. Like we got into the the toy collecting. We got into the retro video game collecting. We did our top five females. And, you know, before we leave, okay, I had an honorable, honorable mention, and I think you had one too. Um, so was your honorable mention Jessica Rabbit? Yeah. Um, she'll, she'll always, like, I think that was kind of like the – the the one that I think, like you said, when you talk to everybody, that's the one female you know, like cartoon character that kind of stands out in people's minds. Um, uh, I have an artist that I that I order stuff from quite a bit, and um, you know, uh, I think that was one of the first commissions that I ever ordered. It was like a Jessica Rabbit in a um, in a Boba Fett costume, and then I got you know uh, Jessica Rabbit. They're, they're, you know, in a uh, slave Leia costume or, you know, I mean, like, I think if you took Jessica Rabbit and you can put her into kind of any role or I think it's, it's so versatile as a uh, as a character, but it's immediately recognizable because of kind of like the provenance that it has with the Roger Rabbit. Yeah, definitely, man. So, like, I want to mention my honorable mention and it's a Street Fighter character. Um... And you pick Cammy, and that was a great one because she's up there for my Street Fighter character. But I think this one was one as a kid that I was always like, man, I just really appreciated uh, this character so much. And not only is she a great martial artist, but my honorable mention is going to have to be Chung Lee. Yeah. Um, listen, I do not speak Japanese, but I will say this. Dome Arigato, Mr. Roboto. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> and also, I will say, me love you long time. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> Chung Lee is, listen, whoever drew her, whoever the character designer was, I knew that this was his, like, Wonder Woman. This was, like, who he wanted to be with. Because Chung Lee has the total package. She's beautiful. She can kick ass. And she kick ass in her freaking outfit as well. So she's kicking ass everywhere. And yeah. if if I could eat her up like a plate of sushi, I would. <laughs> okay? But you're, talking about, not... you're talking about food over there. M&M's and sushi. And... <laughs> but yeah, like Chung Lee is... Yeah, she is definitely... And again, like... I'm going to mention this again, like, w- these are just fake characters, okay? They're not real, but these are just, this is just my honorable mention. Chung Lee definitely is my honorable mention, so I just had to say that, because it was either from my, it was either April O'Neil or Chung Lee for me, I just didn't know who to choose, so I yeah. just had to put her there, so. That's awesome. But, but I, man, yeah. oh, go ahead, Aaron, I'm sorry. No, 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 I was just going to kind of get a little fun fact, so I don't know who the original artist was, but I know why they they put... So when Street Fighter first came out, um, it was one of the I think it it was the first fighting game with kind of like a female character. And the reason that they put the female character in the game, um, Chun-Li in the game was um, to because he thought that um, women would appreciate playing a female character and a powerful female character at that. And it would draw a different demographic into the video game industry so that like women could pl- see themselves like playing as a woman on the, com- on the computer or on the arcade. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that. I yeah. have no idea about that. Oh, that's awesome. That's, that's a, that's a good little fun bit to know. Did not yes, know that. I mean, but but I think over the years, and especially like, definitely had a man's touch in designing that outfit. <laughs> but, you know, the intentions were good, but then all of a sudden, it's like, oh well, let's put her in this little outfit. I feel like like all these men character designers, they knew what they were doing. We all, oh, me absolutely. and Aaron know. So if you get a chance, uh, it's like it's uh, it, there's this meme going on around. And it was like if um, if women's armor in video games um, is the same as men's armor, because like if you if you've ever played any fighting game or like World of Warcraft or whatever, and you see like these women's armor, and it's like it's like okay, level eighty two armor, but it's like a little bikini, <laughs> and then you know you see like a eight level eighty two like warrior armor, you know a guy's armor, and it's like this big like plate mail, like, you know, and it's like. <laughs> If if men if if men had the same um, you know uh, armor as women in video games, they would look much different. <laughs> man, the things the things that run through our minds, man. I, listen, let me not say any more because I don't want to get myself in trouble. So let me not say any more, <laughs> man. I, I I don't want some SJW. You know, to listen to this part of the show and be like, man, that guy Steve and that guy Aaron from Serial Box Pride Podcast, I'm going to go on Facebook and just trash these guys, you know, like <laughs> uh, sooner I, or later, you know. <laughs> I think I think we're OK. I think you covered the bases. You gave all you gave all the, um, you know, the the disclaimers. So I, th- I think I think we're good. That's awesome. Oh, man, that's awesome. So Aaron, man. So you have anything else to say before uh, the podcast is over? I, I think I think we're about at that time. I think I think we r- ran the gambit. I think again, you know, I, I enjoy doing these. I think it's a lot of fun. I think this was, like you said, I think this was the best one we've had so far, and I can't wait to I can't wait to make more because and uh, you know we'll just we'll just keep on rolling. I mean, there's always going to be you know um, you know new toys coming out. Oh, you know, we could talk about old toys, but I think kind of doing this, uh, you know top five i think i think like you said i want to i want to get that as a segment in our uh in our show you know at least at least every other show so that we could talk about that because that was a lot of fun yeah yeah you know what and you know what else i'm gonna do i think it'll be cool for for the listeners too is uh what i'm gonna start doing with the top fives is i'll actually you can listen to the whole episode and listen to it too but i'll break down the top fives and just add them um on youtube as like a separate thing so all our top five starting will be their top five female characters, top five, whatever. So I'll, yeah. I'll do that with this show too. I'll, I'll do a separate 
top five for this also. But man, what this was awesome. This was this was a great podcast. Uh, listen, I just want to say thank you to all the audience out there listening. Um, you know, we're up to like 17 subscribers right now, and it's only been like two and a half, three months, you know, of this podcast. But I wouldn't be able to do this without my co host, Aaron Schmelzer. So, Aaron, thank you again for, you know, just being my co host for this show, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. I mean, this is this is awesome. I really enjoy it, and I can't wait to continue making these. And, you know, hopefully that that, uh, you know, viewership grows, the, su- the subscribership, if that's even a word, grows. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's cool to see to see the the kind of community grow. And, you know, I, I think that if anybody has any questions or, you know, has a topic that, um, you know, you want us to talk about, you know, definitely reach out, you know, and, uh, you know, shoot us a, a message on Facebook or, you know, let us know what what's going on or if there's something you want us to talk about because you know i think you know like you know just steve me and dave and you know the rest of our you know friends and family you know it's a community and you know having building that community from the ground up is something really exciting so i can't wait to see what the future holds yes 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 and with that guys don't forget to like and subscribe to us on the YouTube page, Cereal Box Prize Podcast. Uh, you'll find the Toy Owl segments, which that's our special segment where we just uh, dwell into just the toy history of a certain toy line. So don't forget to subscribe and like on our on our YouTube page. Also, head over, head over to Facebook. Our Facebook page is Cereal Box Prize Podcast. Check it out. And also go to anchor.fm. Uh, when you go to anchor.fm, that's going to lead you to everywhere where you listen to our podcast on spotify on um uh what was it uh a bunch of other platforms but yeah go on anchor.fm it's going to give you all the links to where you can listen to our, to our podcast and yeah man like we have a lot of great things in store for you guys uh i am trying to reach out for a few people for me and Aaron can interview i'm also working on a website for the podcast and i'm gonna try to get some podcast t-shirts made so a lot of things happening, a lot of things happening. But again, I wouldn't be able to do it for my co-host, Aaron Schmelzer. And with that, I'm Steve Garcia, and I'm with Aaron Schmelzer. Aaron? Yeah, have a good night, and uh, we'll see you on the flip side. See you guys on the flip side, and we're out of here. <laughs>